Good morning. Welcome to Redemption. My name is Joy. I'm a member here. I'm glad you're here today. Um, I have two girls, and they're grown now, but we kind of have this saying in our house. Um, it's just two little words. You say them all the time. But we say them. It's not the words we say. It's the way we say them. And we know if we say it to each other, it kind of conveys a meaning that we kind of, we get, we know. And the words are a lot, but we don't say a lot. We say, it's a lot. And we know if we're having a conversation and one of us says that to each other, sometimes we describe the three of us as a lot, just to kind of let people know. But sometimes they might be describing a person or a situation or the way they're feeling, and we say, it's, it's a lot. It's just a lot. And I know, and they know, that if I say that or they say that, that what it means to us is that they're just, we don't really have words right now. It's too much. It's too intense. We're overwhelmed. We can't really um, articulate our feelings. And so we use that a lot. Just two little words. But the meaning behind it, we know what that means to each other. Well, I don't know about you, but for me right now, out there, the world is a lot. It's just a lot. And, and maybe you feel that way too. Maybe you don't, but maybe you do. And maybe not only do you feel like out there's a lot, maybe you brought that in here today. And maybe in here, in your heart, you feel a lot. Or maybe it's in your thinking, in your mind. You're not sleeping. You're not thinking straight because of everything. It's just a lot. Well, you are in the right place today to hear God's word and this call to worship. So will you stand with me as I read Psalm 93? The Lord reigns. Yes, he does. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness benefits your house, O oh Lord, forevermore. Good morning, Redemption. Let's worship.
conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored In the church of
read from Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 23. And Jesus said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? The next song we're singing is I Surrender All. And this needs to be sung more as a prayer over our lives. So let us sing this as people desiring to give our whole lives our all to the Father.
Father, by the power of your spirit, help us surrender all to you. Let us forsake worldly pleasures and know the joy of full salvation. Father, we love you. Help us to love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. to Redemption Church. My name is Josh, one of the pastors here. If you have a copy of the scriptures, uh, find the fifth book of the New Testament uh, called the book of Acts. We'll begin our verse-by-verse -verse study through this book. did an overview last week. If you missed that, you can find that on our app or website or iTunes podcast and get caught up. We'll be in Acts chapter 1, verse 1 through, through verse uh, 12 today. Um, no matter what sort of personality test I've taken through the years, whether it's the Meyer Briggs or the DISC test or the Enneagram, Enneagram test, uh, I, I always come out as a person who is sort of easily bored. Uh, in a great rush to get onto the scene and then in a great rush to get out of it. Um, some of that I'm sure is personality, some's probably my ADD, uh, and some of it is probably just sin and selfishness uh, and wanting to do what I want to do when I want to do it. Um, but, but you put that together and it can be um, uh, sort of a dissatisfaction with the present and always sort of living out to the next thing. I came to a head at, uh, it, during my final year at seminary. I had come off the previous summer doing a summer-long internship in Nacogdoches, Texas in a local church, uh, really involved and engaged in a whole uh, ministry field that I envisioned and felt God was calling me to in the next season of, of life once I graduated and and that final year I was preparing to come back and start what has become Redemption Church and so I'm taking classes I'm making contacts with leaders visits back here to Huntington and um, in the, the course of all that I naturally became more and more disconnected with my involvement in Dallas I was teaching a college Sunday school class at our church uh, had become sort of disengaged from the relationships there, losing my focus even in some of the classes that I was wrapping up. And my wife and I both were feeling some of that, particularly when we ran across a quote from a journal, uh, from the journal of a man named Jim Elliott. Many of you may know that name. And the, uh, the, the statement went like this, and it sort of convicted us. Wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt every situation in which you believe it is the will of God. And, and that man, Jim Elliott, did that. He was passionate and extremely gifted in making known to others the message of Jesus Christ. And yet he walked very humbly and sacrificially with his God. In fact, in 1949, upon graduation from Wheaton College, he and his wife, Elizabeth Elliott, who we have a quote framed by her in the women's bathroom. Uh, so you women see that. Boys, maybe one of these days during the week you knock. If nobody's in there, you go in there and see it. Uh, he and his wife, alongside uh, four others, uh, Ed McCauley, Pete Fleming, Roger Udarian, and... Uh, Nate Saint and their wives journeyed to uh, Quito, Ecuador to reach what was then viewed as the most dangerous people group in the world from the outside cultures referred to as Alka Indians. And strategized and began to reach out to that village and made contact and had several very encouraging 
uh, encounters and relationships were beginning to be built, even took a couple of them up in their plane that they had, which was an otherworldly experience, obviously, to that group. Until one day they were brutally and savagely, all five men murdered, speared to death. Their wives obviously instantly widows and reeling. Intimidating enough, Roger Udarian's grandchildren were in my college class there in Dallas. You talk about that. I tried to work a quote in every week of their grandfather. But the news organizations picked up that story of their amazing faith, their courage, their, their adventurous spirit, and spread the message across the world. And those short, inspiring lives changed a whole generation of missionaries that picked up the baton and took it all over the globe. It's probably safe to say that America has not produced a more famous missionary than Jim Elliott, to large part because of his wife's books, Under the Shadow of the Almighty and Through Gates of Splendor, which tell the story. And then amazingly enough, the wives and others went back to Ecuador with the message of the gospel, made contact, and I'm not sure the stats now, but at one point the entire village came to Christ. Amen. Um, if you were with us in the core team building of our church, you will know that one of the first people that we financially supported and sent out was Beth Patton, whose family had done many years of ministry there. And Brian Patton is still a member of our church here today. You can talk to him about some of the stories. They even came here, a couple of the members of that. Wa'adani is what they refer to, them as, or refer to themselves as, and what they're called now as a people group, came back to Huntington even. And so it's an amazing story of living every day to the hilt. Through our study of the book of Acts, I, I want you to begin to think of yourself that way. Not many of you will go to another country in a foreign language and be martyred. But that every single member of our church would, would view yourself as placed in a specific sphere of influence to be all there. And as you are there, that, that you would be provocative and creative. And, and passionate and bold to love Jesus deeply, to love people deeply, and to feel called to make the person of Jesus Christ and His message specifically known to the people in your life. That you'd be risky. That you'd be fearless and politically incorrect. Not stupid, not mean, not rude, but but that you would you would very in a very real sense see that Christ is relevant today to this city, to this tri-state, and you'd say so. That you would realize that the most compelling and contagious thing that Christians can be in the United States of America in 2021 is counter-cultural. Distinct and different. That God has you in His story living an adventure. Wouldn't you love to live that way? I think that's what we see in the book of Acts. I said last week that this book shouldn't be called the Acts of the Apostles of the apostles, it should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. I'll give you another name for the book. The Adventures of Christians. <laughs> that Jesus said a promise to His followers in five words, I will build my church. And He was committed to that. He's still committed to that. The adventure is still ours to join. And regardless of your personality or your experience or your background or your gifts or your intelligence, 
All of us join the story and the adventure to follow Jesus Christ the same way. We've got to know who He is. We've got to know what He's done. And we've got to know what, he, what He's taught. And so naturally, that's exactly where the book of Acts starts. <clears throat> Chapter 1, verse 1. In the first book, Old Theophilus, this is a, the original audience, Luke, a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul, a physician, but also an historian, who's done a lot of research, has put together a, a document of Christian origins. And he says, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. That, that's the Gospel according to Luke, the third book of your New Testament. And if you read that, you, you will discover that, that the eternal God of the universe who, who's always existed and created everything that does exist decided that at a point in human history He would enter the world and take on human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. That he, he steps into history. That's Bethlehem. That's the Christmas story. And, and that He lives the only perfect sinless life that any human has, has ever lived. That he, he became a righteous substitute fulfilling all of God's call and all humanity. We've, we've all fallen short of, but Jesus perfectly completes and then He dies on the cross in our place for our sins on our behalf to pay the penalty of the sin that we owe and absorb the righteous justice of God on His body. And then He is raised literally bodily from the dead. He is the walking, talking revelation of God to the world. And the embodiment of of the power of God in the world. Saying, God saves sinners. And He's building a kingdom of rescued sinners. And the Gospel of Luke tells that story all the way in verse 2 until the day when Jesus was taken up. That's the ascension. His living physically on the earth is called the Incarnation. He took on flesh and dwelt among us. And then He physically left the physical realm and went into the invisible realm, many times called heaven, to the Father. And that's called the ascension. But you know what? After Jesus' incarnation ascended to the Father, God has incarnated the world again through His people. That the same Spirit by which Jesus lived and did what He did now indwells His people so that the church is the walking, talking message of Christ. That we are the, are the embodiment of the power of the Holy Spirit in the world. Not in the same way fully like Jesus did. Of course not. But when the world wants to see what Jesus is like and what He did and to hear about that and to see the power of God transforming the world, he looks at, they look at the church. And that's Luke picking up where that story of God's incarnation of the church begins here in his second book called Acts. And it began with 11 men who physically walked with Him for about three and a half years of his ministry called disciples given an office called apostles which means sent ones and these 11 men it says after he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen so they have commands they have truth they have the message as you're going to see here in a minute they get the mission but you know what they're lacking at this point in Christian history no power. They have no indwelling Holy Spirit. They've just got the message. They, they've just got the, the mission, but they do have the truth, and they're fully convinced of the message. Why? Because of His resurrection. See at verse 
3, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. There are a couple objective historical facts. They're real. They really happen that undergird Christianity, that they are foundational under our faith. And if they are lost or they crumble, the whole faith crumbles. And one of them is the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's not allegorical. Christians believe that really happened. He came back from the dead. If you lose that, you lose Christianity. If, if, if you find Jesus' body and you drag that out, I'm out. I'm no longer a Christian. I quit. Why? Because he died like anybody else. He didn't save me from my sins. He's not God like He claimed to be. But He did literally uh, resurrect from the dead and, and He proves it to them. Many proofs. And He lists a couple, three here. First, there's a visual proof. He appeared to them. He presented Himself alive to them. They saw Him. Other Gospels, we find out they touch Him physically. He gives a time-tested proof. It's not just a vague appearance. Maybe it was in 40 days He's walking the earth resurrected. We know from 1 Corinthians He appears to over 500 people. Is it just 11 folks? 500. Over 500 He appears to. Third, it's an audible proof. He spoke to them. Again, in other Gospels, we know He eats with them. The whole point is, is He's not a ghost. This isn't a, an hallucination. This is a physical, real, raised body. That's important for a couple of reasons. First, it's a demonstration that death lost. That, that death is defeated. That the physical body, your physical body, will be raised from the dead as well. <clears throat> that this earth will be renewed and redeemed. The resurrection is a declaration. We're not going to be fat little babies in a diaper floating on a cloud with a harp and halo. You're getting a body. You live on this planet. The resurrection says that. We win. God wins. Second, there's a spiritual component. It's a demonstration that God the Father looks at this life and says, I accept that. That's the way. That's the truth. That's the life. No one comes to me but through Him. His life I accept. His death I accept. He's vindicated. He's raised. So a literal raised a resurrection is essential. Can't not believe it and be a believer. So he, he gives them proofs of his resurrection and then he reminds them of the promise. So there's resurrection proofs and then there's a reminder of the promise in verse 4 and 5. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. So the Father promised it. Jesus said, I've promised it. And John the Baptist you remember in the gospel accounts? He promised it because when he baptized with water, he said, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so with this and beginning with this, I, I see a, <clears throat> a, uh, a teaching on the power of the Holy Spirit, what it is and what it isn't. Many of them are surprising, honestly. And in our day, if we're not careful, we're going to assume some things about the Spirit's power that aren't true. And this isn't one of the four yet, but, but I think it's so intriguing that he, he, uh, he tells them to wait. To, to, to not depart from Jerusalem. Because the most natural thing in the world is seeing a resurrected Jesus Christ and getting the message that we're to go to the nations is to say, well, let's, let's hit it. Let's go. Jesus says, no, you don't have the power yet. 
You've got the message. You've got the faith. But you have no ability. You, you can really believe in Jesus' resurrection. You can have seen it. You can tell people about Jesus all the time. But if you have no power, it's useless. Not only will you not persevere, not only will you lose courage, but it is the Spirit who regenerates hearts and gives faith. And so if anybody's going to trust that message, you've got to have the Spirit involved and, and engaged. So you track it with this. You've got God incarnate. You've got the eternal Son of God who in point of history takes on flesh. How? He was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the Virgin Mary. So He was conceived in the Spirit. He lives a perfect, sinless life. How? The power of the Spirit. He does miracles to demonstrate His deity that only God can do. How? By the Spirit. You read the Gospel of Luke and you will read a phrase over and over again. He was led by the Spirit. 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 He dies on the cross and is raised from the dead. By whom? The Holy Spirit. It's, and so all of that inaugurated kingdom and promised kingdom is a spirit kingdom. And now that message and that mission is in the hands of these 11. They've got it. But they have no power. So they've got to wait. Which is exactly what they do. Now four things about this promise. Promised power of the Holy Spirit. I'll, I'll do it this way. What it is and what it isn't. Four, four statements. The first to begin with in verse 5 is this power is not a symbol. It is a reality. The power of the Holy Spirit is not symbolic. It's real. This water baptism that John was doing preceding the ministry of Christ and even Jesus and His disciples did following John the Baptist was symbolic. It was a way of saying to the followers of Christ and the greater culture and community, I am identifying with Jesus, His message, His work, His ministry. Symbolic. That's called water baptism. Spirit baptism is not to be placed in water, but is to be baptized into the Spirit or into Christ. It just means to be placed into. So when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are spiritually really placed into Christ. And His Spirit is literally put into you. So you are united in a real sense. Even metaphysical sense. And will always be. So this isn't just symbolic identification. You really are united to Christ through His Spirit. That's what it means. You'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And it, it, it won't be many days from now. Verse 6, the Holy Spirit is not a program, but is an ability. It's a power. So when they had come together, they asked Him, Lord, will You at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Why would you ask that? That might be a weird question for you. 2021, predominantly Gentiles, to ask. Why, when he said, I'm going to be baptized by the, the Holy Spirit, after 40 days of him speaking on the kingdom of God, what I asked is that this time you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Most natural question in the world for them to ask. Again, for 40 days, he's already been, he's been talking about the kingdom. And they know Jeremiah 31, they know Ezekiel 36, which talks about the new covenant. And the Holy Spirit's coming. They know Joel too. All of them saying there is coming a day in which the Spirit will fall upon my people and indwell them and empower them. Not some of them, but all of them. Not temporarily, but forever. And will wash them and renew them and empower them. And they will be a part of this kingdom. The most natural thing in the world for the disciples to say, down. But their question reveals some wrong priorities that wants to turn this power of the Holy Spirit into a program rather than an ability. 
John Calvin, the Genevan reformer, says their question has as many errors as words. The first error is, will you restore the kingdom? This isn't a political kingdom, which is what restoration means. Are you going to overthrow the Romans and give us our land back, our, our, our place back? No, it's not the kind of kingdom I'm instituting. Is it going to be for Israel only? Jesus, no, 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 no. It's this is not a national kingdom. This is an ethnic kingdom. There will be no Jews and Gentiles. There'll be, this will be a kingdom of every nation, tongue, and tribe. Will this be an immediate kingdom at this time? No. It's inaugurated now. But there's going to be a, a great parenthesis in its inauguration at Jesus' resurrection to the consummation at, at the end of all things. So all of them wrong expectations. And so Jesus said, no, 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 no. This isn't, a, this isn't about a program. He said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority. That's a good tip for you guys who are all obsessed with end times and, and charts and timelines. And all. Jesus, Jesus is not, don't, don't worry about the times and seasons. It's the Father. He's fixed on His authority. Here's what you need to be focused on. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon, upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and, and to the end of the earth. This is a, an ability, not a program. Now's a good time probably for me to stop and, and clarify what I mean by power here. Ability. You know what the Greek word for power here is? It's, it's dunamis. We get our English word dynamite from that. So you, you'll receive dynamite when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now what do you think about dynamite? Right? Energy, noise, explosion, impact, detonate. Right? You think of that kind of that's that's not what this is. A better word, I think, is dynamic. You have a dynamic, a distinct, I'm tempted to say charismatic, contagious, compelling. Ability. And, and it won't necessarily be connected to the external. I was thinking about all this and how to get this across and came, had come home from writing a big chunk of the sermon. This has been about a month ago now. And, and I was coming home, came to an intersection, which it looked like I, it happened before I got there, but based on glass and different things in the intersection, it looked like it had been a wreck. A pole was knocked over and the red lights were out. There's police there, the people cleaning up. All kinds of folks sort of wrapping it up. And out in the middle, it was almost a stereotype, was a, a cop. And he's big. I don't know how tall. I mean, big old guy. About 6'5", you know, muscly, brawn, brawny. And he had these almost feminine white gloves on. And he's out there, you know, waving the traffic and this and that. He has the ability to stop the traffic. Now, I'm in a truck. I'd run him right over the phone. But I didn't. I stopped. Why? Because of those white gloves. And that badge. He, he had a dynamic that could stop me and tell me when to go. That, that wasn't external. It, it, it was a, his position, his role, his authority his, his uh, innate, inherent, invisible ability that was delegated to him by, by another. The, the Holy Spirit's program is not loud. It's almost always quiet and, and invisible. Now, when it does physically manifest, look at how Jesus tells us this power will manifest. But you will receive power and what? Start doing miracles and signs. Although these apostles do. 
They, they, they get that ministry, almost all of them, as they're getting the authority to, to validate the message of the Bible that they write. But what you will see in the New Testament is less, 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 less of these sensational, miraculous things. They almost all together disappear. Now, I still think that the Spirit can do them and that they're out there, but I think it's very rare. And I think the apostles had the ability to do that in a very unique way because they were in a unique place of history to give authorization to their writings and their ministry. He doesn't say when you receive power, there's going to be all kinds of miracles. He says when the Holy Spirit's power come on upon you, you know what you'll be marked by? Witnessing. You will be my witnesses, which leads to the third thing. This power isn't to promote, but to witness. The Holy Spirit's power does not lead to promotion, but to witnessing. What does a witness do? He, he says, this is what I saw. Or, or, or this is what I heard. Or, or this is what I experienced. And Jesus says, when it comes to the kingdom of God and your role and your ministry, you're going to go into the world and say, Jesus did some things. I have experienced Jesus in these ways. That our message and our mission is that this real man did real things with real implications. And, and, and you can get in on it. We aren't to simply be on mission, church. We are the mission. We're it. And you know what I love about this is I don't read anything about skill. I don't read anything about intelligence or personality or persuasiveness or giftedness or experience or education or training. It all has to do with this, this power of the Spirit. All they do is speak. Isn't that great? Doesn't that take the pressure off? You have to be a salesman. You don't have to be a good debater. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be a recruiter. You just have to witness. And the Holy Spirit does it all. You know what really we are? Storytellers. We tell Jesus' story. We tell our story. We call them to get in on it. That's, that's God's work on whether or not people accept that message tonight, to, uh, today. And, and guys, while it's, it's helpful and perfectly acceptable to invite people to church, we want you to do that. We want it to be access accessible. We want people to undistractedly and easily and hospitably be welcome into our gatherings so they can hear a clear, uh, accurate, compelling message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I, I'm, I'm finding far too many Christians promoting their church. Our church is great. Oh, you ought to come to our church. Look at what our church is doing. Don't put the signs in your yard, I love my church. <laughs> Don't point people to Redemption Church. Say, I, I love the Redeemer. I don't love redemption, I love the Redeemer. I witness to, to the Redeemer. And again, that, that, that can go too far. I get it. But we don't promote. We witness. Fourth one, final one. This power is not restricted. It's universal. It, it, this, is, this is a power that is not restricted. It's universal. It's, it's going to be in Jerusalem. It's going to be in all Judea and Samaria. It's going to be to the end of the earth. And even in the book of Acts, you're going to see that the way they do it Completely different. The Spirit does it one way over here. He does it another way over there. He's, there's not the way. Christians, we can get very myopic. And I don't mean universal in the sense that everybody gets a part of it. What I mean is the Spirit is, is doing things all over the world. Multiple cultures. It's easy for me to feel like my needs are the needs of the church. Or... or uh, you know, my style is the right style to do this. 
or, or, or our experience of the Holy Spirit is the way you experience the Holy Spirit. No. Holy Spirit's doing a million things in the world, and much of it you're not, you have no part in. And I have no part in. That's that's okay. That, 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 that's all right. He, he's reaching this culture this way. He's reaching that culture that way. He's going to do things in you and through you and with your ways and your style and your strategy and your outreach that's altogether unique to you. And the Spirit's in it. Great. Embrace it. Celebrate it. Not just in the world, but in this city. Let's not lose that distinction that's been a part of our church from the beginning is that we will, we will not get bogged down in the non-essentials. We will major on the majors and minor on the minors and we'll, we'll stay, on, stay in our lane. What I love about this church, you don't always know this because you're, you don't get to know all the stories. We've got people in this church, I mean from, every, I think, every denomination. Roman Catholics, Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, Independent Baptist. Charismatic, atheist, Jewish, on and on and on. I mean, it's everywhere. I love that. And the words that I think it was Melanchthon. In the essentials, unity. Non essentials, liberty. All things, charity, love. That's us. Holy Spirit is doing something just by way of example, in the Reformed Anglican Church right now. We're singing some songs out of the Anglican Church. I've got good friends who plant in Anglican churches in, in West Virginia. Worked with a guy at Covenant who's a, a priest in the Anglican Church. What about that? Well, praise God. I, I, can, I affirm the 39 articles. Read that. It's great. I like the common book of prayer. Great. I have no desire to worship in any church. Lectionaries, creeds, and up and down. I'd have to wear a dress. I mean, a robe. <laughs> That's an ender. No resurrection, I'm out. Have to wear a robe, I'm out. Right? Hold closed hand. <laughs> no, it's not. no, I thank God for what, uh, what He's doing in the Anglican church. We've got... Members in this church are Calvinists. We got members in this church who are Arminians. We got members in this church who have no idea what that is. Uh, great. Good. Good. So I'll say to you Calvinists because you're typically the mean ones. Hey, Arminians are saved. They love Jesus. They believe their Bible. They're on our team. They may be right. Some of you are on Facebook and progressive circles saying things and people in this church are like, oh, God. <laughs> Quirming. <laughs> Those of you who are on the right wing end of the spectrum and you're posting things that people and aggressive are going, oh, God. <laughs> I'm glad that we've got people in this church in both worlds being witnesses to Jesus Christ. I'm glad you're there. Glad you're there. The point being, I think the church that is going to experience and to demonstrate the power of the Holy Spirit in this city is not going to be one that is hung up on labels and categories and styles. I, I'm not giving my life as a pastor to any of those things. It, we will be a powerful spirit in uh, led church impacting church when we witness to the person and work of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, verse 9. When he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. Like, I'm probably going to be lifted up after I made some of those statements. But, uh, <laughs> but he was lifted up and look, a cloud took him out of their sight. I said, I've been teaching that wrong all along. When I teach uh, particularly high school students, I always try to point out that Jesus can fly. He, you know, that's not true. I think a cloud comes down and a cloud lifts up. I don't know what matters, but uh, I think that's 
That's happening. Took him up, and that's weird. I mean, that'd be strange to see. Took him up out of their sight, and while they're gazing into heaven, understatement of the year, you know, mouths open, speechless, except for Peter. Peter was probably like, now guys, what's going on here? Is I'll explain this. <laughs> But as he's doing it, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. Where are they come from? These two guys kind of walk up and said, uh, why y'all standing looking into heaven? Jesus didn't tell them to do that. But why are you looking up? He'll come the same way as you saw him go into heaven. See, Christians from the very beginning have been doing this. It's not you that just get off in the weeds of the non-essentials. That's church history. Amen. There's a proneness in all of us to get all... Uh, it's called mission drift. He said, you go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. They're sitting there in the sky looking up. Uh, they, they need to stop worrying about end times and start worrying about the ends of the earth. He'll come back the way He came. It's not yours to know the times and the seasons. You're to witness to the power of God out in the person of Christ. So they do. They, they snap out of it. And angels will do that. And they return to Jerusalem from the Mount, of all, Mount, Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And then in verse 13 and 14, you're going to see the group who's there. We'll talk a lot more about that next, next week. But guys, it's easy in our day of unprecedented advancement to, to forget that we're living in a day of unprecedented need. There's not enough entertainment to satisfy Their, their possession, there's not enough stuff in the world to own that, that can, you know, make you happy. They, they, our culture is starving and is as thirsty for meaning and purpose and security and acceptance as they've ever been. And they can't come up with new things fast enough to scratch the itch. And here we are with the message and mission of Jesus Christ that says, one infinite joy forever. And unfortunately, we're looking in the sky thinking, when can we get out of here? Rather than looking around and say, how many can we take away? All right, I'll, I'll wrap this up here. Two concluding statements to maybe jumpstart our witnessing. This verse was so hokey. I thought, I, I did it anyway. First, to spread the power of Christ, people have to be infected. You believe that? <laughs> to spread the power of, of Christ, we've got to be infected with it. We first have to receive Christ, and with Christ we get His power. And then we've got to be around other people. And these days we can be around other people and six feet apart with a mask on. Okay, okay. But through that mask, they need to be hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. So they too can receive the, the message. I find it so beautiful that they don't have any strategy. There's nothing really impressive about them. They just start saying things about Christ. And it becomes a pandemic of truth to the point where it says it turned the whole world upside down. To spread the power of Christ, you first have got to be infected. Second, to impact a self-reliant world, the power must be released. And we're not just talking to a self-reliant world, we're self-reliant. And we try to do our missions and our witnessing in a self-reliant way. Yep. In a self-reliant world in which the messengers and the recipients are self-reliant, the 
power's the one that's got to do the do the stuff. I'm often shocked at how little I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. The most probably effective evangelist in the history of the world, except indirectly through obviously the writings of the Bible, or the, the authors of the Bible, is Billy Graham. More people, I mean, it's crazy how much. And I remember one time in Dallas when he came to do a crusade, and I sat down there, with my wife, and heard him. He was preaching from a stool at the time, he was older. And, he delivered a message, and I get it, I'm in seminary, and I'm snotty at that point. I'm still snotty, but more snotty then than I was right. him now. And, and uh, he, he shared the gospel, and I thought, if you're a non-Christian, I don't have, have any idea that you would know what in the world just happened right there. I, I wasn't clear. I, imagine me saying that about Billy Graham, but I, <laughs> I thought, nobody understands that. Nobody's going to come to Christ. And at the end of the crusade, they came by the thousands <laughs> to trust Christ. You watch him on TV, he's saying stuff like, the Bible says, and he reads it, God loves you. Jesus died for you and rose again. Wouldn't you like to get saved, brother? <laughs> and by the millions, they've said, yep, I'll take it. And they come on in. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Just tell someone. Then when people get saved, just say, that was God, that wasn't me. Surprising as it sounds, guys, we are a part of a revolution. But it's quiet. It's subtle. And it won't necessarily be accompanied by the miraculous. Probably won't. But it'll happen when a confused life gets direction. It'll happen when an empty life is full. When a sinful and painful life gets relief and forgiveness. When a guilty life gets hope. Dunamis. Power. And, and if you've never prayed to Jesus Christ and accepted Him as your God and Savior, believing His death and resurrection for you, today is the day. God loves you. He died and rose from the dead for you to be saved and get eternal life. Wouldn't you like to get saved? He who has the Son has life. He who has, does not have the Son does not have life. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And if you've never called on the name of the Lord, do that right now. It begins with simple faith. He's not asking for you to give Him anything. He's, he's asking you to receive Him. Lord, You're the one who never stops working. You've, you've, you've written a book that never ends. You have a power that, that never reaches a limit. And you have sent your Son that never, who never stops saving. I pray that you would save and empower so that we would not only cope with life, but would begin to live it to the full on an adventure with you. And I thank you ahead of time for the revival that will happen in our place, in our church, in our day starting now. I ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. as a church get ready to take communion together um, I'm going to read from Luke 22 that's verse 19 and 20 and he took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to them saying this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me and likewise the cup after they had eaten saying this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood and have you ever heard of the concept of uh, object permanence with little kids is that they 
they forget really important things as soon as it leaves their sight. And we think that we grow out of that. I don't really think we do. We almost have like an abstract permanence where we forget really important things as soon as it leaves our sight. And I think the communion is the perfect example of that. It's a reminder of the blood and the body of Christ that was broken and shed for us. But we forget it all the time. So think of the last time that you forgot something really, really important. I remember I, uh, I forgot my daughter here at church one day. Uh, I, 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 okay, I, I drive separately from, with my wife because I play in the band. And so we were in separate cars. She had told me to get Avery out of class. I assumed that she did and forgot. So I left my own kid here. Uh, if I'm willing to forget her, like one of the most important things in my life, God knows that we need remembrance every week of the sacrifice that it took for us to be reconciled to God. Uh, so as we as a church body, if you're a Christian, uh, as they pass these crackers and this juice around as a symbol of the reconciliation that we have with God because of Christ's sacrifice, uh, please join us as the band church to play. Oh, precious. 
Thank you for worshiping with us. My name is Rory. I'm the youth leader here. If uh, you are new and looking to connect, maybe you've been coming for a few weeks and you want to get connected to the things we're doing at Redemption Church, you can take one of those uh, connect cards in the seat backs in front of you, tear that off, fill that out, bring it to the connect desk out in the lobby. There'll be somebody there to take that from you and give you a little parting gift for being with us. Um, we got a QR code with announcements to throw up there, maybe? Yeah, there they are. Two things I want to highlight, though, especially if you're new. Two weeks from now, that's the 26th, we're going to have pastors and coffee after the worship gathering where you can get connected and ask questions with one of the pastors and have coffee. Or if you're into tea, you can do that too, I bet. Weirdos. Um, and then a week after that, especially if you're new and want to get even more connected, we are starting a new six-week membership class. It's going to run, again, from October 3rd, so it's the first Sunday in October, six Sundays in a row at 9 a.m., okay? So if you're wanting to become a member, again, membership, not something necessarily commanded in the New Testament, but it's good, I promise. I am one, so I can speak to that. Anyways, all right, let me send you off with a benediction. Put your hands out, and if you're watching online, put your hands out, because you're just as much a part of us as anyone in here. So, Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, giver of every good thing and sustainer of your church, Make us, the people of Redemption Church, bold in our witness as storytellers of Jesus, firm in our conviction as believers in Jesus, and confident in our reality as partakers with Jesus of the Holy Spirit. Grant your people grace to see the power of the Holy Spirit at work in and through us, to see the lost saved in your church, to experience lives transformed by your church and to feel love poured out through your church. Holy Spirit of God, remind us that you are not merely in our midst, but in our hearts. Point us to Jesus, the risen and ascended Lord, who prepares a place for all of us. To him be all the glory, and to us be all the joy. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and Redemption Church said, Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.